Okay, uh, I'm getting started a little late. Um, there actually is no one here, um, here in person or on Zoom. So, but I'm still going to try to get this lecture and record it. It's, I guess some, some people may be counting on watching the recording. Um, um, if this is going to happen a lot, obviously it would make sense for me to keep driving into Santa Cruz to record my lecture here when I could do it at home. Uh, so I may have to uh, consult with people about what it is you actually want from me. Um, but in any case, like I said, I'll try and give a lecture now for the recording. It's a little weird to talk to no one, but I'll try. Um, so the first thing I should do actually is go through the, go over the assignment. It's due Monday, the 18th. Sharing my screen. Okay. So, um, you know, this is called First Short Essay. Um, it's really, it's an essay question, basically. Um, uh, instructions are pretty straightforward. Uh, um, just choose one of the questions. Now, I think, um, yeah, I was hoping to add a fourth question, but I didn't get around to that. So you have three questions to decide between and just choose one of them and the answer it best you can in two or three pages. So this is not like a paper where you have to write an introduction and a conclusion and think of a title and all that stuff. Just it's like an essay question, you know, on a test. Just answer the question. Um, of course, the questions are not that easy. It's hard to write easy questions about shelling. <laughs> Um, but at least I've tried to make them such that it will be possible for you to answer them. And of course, I'll, you know, assess the results relative to what it seemed people were able to do. Um, is there anything else I have to say about this? Um, just that it's due on Canvas. It's due by 11.55 p.m. Monday. Um, PDF, Word, or various more esoteric things that I could turn into a PDF are all fine. Um, okay, this is where, of course, I would normally say, are there any questions? But obviously, there aren't any questions because no one here. Okay. So today I'm going to talk mostly about aids to reflection. The reading for today had these two parts. The first part was essay 11 from the essays on the principles of method in uh, a friend. And, um, and then the other part was from uh, the early parts of aids to reflection. But so I'm mostly going to talk about AIDS reflection, but stuff from that friend reading is going to come up in various places. Um, so first of all, about what AIDS to reflection is, it's an odd book. Um, basically, everything Coleridge wrote was kind of odd. Um, so, uh, so this is a book that started off, as he explains in the forward or the preface or whatever, um, as his first idea, which is already somewhat odd, is that this guy, Robert, I guess it's pronounced, um, from 1611 to 1684, and he was um, 
Archbishop of Glasgow uh, uh, until 1662. I don't know when he started, but um, and he wrote, I guess, you know, I haven't tried to look at these things in the original context, um, but uh, he wrote kind of uh, theological uh, sermon type literature, basically. Uh, um, so uh, Coleridge thinks that this work contains some important religious slash philosophical insights. And so his original idea was to make a selection of interesting passages from this guy's writings and publish them as a book with a little bit of editorial commentary. But, um, um, Instead, what ended up happening, at least as he describes it, is that the commentary got longer and longer, and he started adding much more of his own material in between, to the point where now it's just every once in a while it might be a quote from Lincoln or someone else, but it's mostly just Coleridge. So that is both the text and the commentary is mostly Coleridge, right? So he'll write something, an aphorism, and then he'll write a long commentary on it. Um, and uh, the aphorisms, I guess I should say one other thing, you know, so Coleridge's interest in this is, I guess, specifically in the context of this particular guy's, context of this particular guy's writing, but it's part of, as I mentioned before, Coleridge becoming more politically and religiously conservative as he got older, and he's trying to um, recapture uh, um, a voice from the earlier days of Anglicanism um, and get people to return to that. Um, but as I said, it mostly turns into just Coleridge talking to himself. Um, and we just quote Leighton, he often actually ends up disagreeing with him. <laughs> so that first design didn't really go through. Um, anyway, so he, you know, Coleridge calls the things that he's writing, whether they're his own or selections from Leighton, aphorisms. Now, like, he has a little note about what aphorism really means, but you know, I mean, but like normally aphorism you would think of as a short, like one or two sentences um, statement, like in some of Nietzsche's books, there's lists of aphorisms um, uh, where each one is just one or two sentences. So Coleridge's aphorisms are not that short. And as the book gets on, goes on, they get longer and longer. And then there's this commentary attached to them. And as the book gets goes on, that commentary gets even longer. <laughs> um, so uh, it's uh, this the style couldn't be described as aphoristic in the usual sense. However, it is true that as long as it gets, the style is not really argument. And this is different from Schelling, right? Schelling was hard to follow, but he was definitely stating some theses and trying to prove them. Um, Coleridge, a lot of the time, is just telling you stuff. So, um, um, and that's going to be mostly true of the rest of the people we read in this course. So that makes them different from uh, a lot of philosophers that you would read in other courses, um, where most of the interest consists in trying to figure out how the argument works. Um, um, as I guess 
I said or connected to things I said before, there is something characteristically 19th century about this, although there were people in other centuries who wrote this way too. Uh, um, but um, so, you know, it makes it difficult to know how to approach it in a philosophy class. With Coleridge, it's, it's not as difficult as it will be with Emerson um, and uh, Fuller and especially Nietzsche, um, where uh, not only is there no argument, but there's nothing, uh, it's often hard to pin something down that looks like a philosophical thesis. Um, Coleridge seems to be talking about familiar philosophical issues, the relationship between understanding and reason and morality and religion and so on and so forth. So, you know, at least we can focus on trying to understand what he's saying and how the pieces are supposed to go together. Um, and also on what kind of commentary this might be or reaction this might be to his predecessors who talked about the same thing. Um, so I guess something like what I was just saying about the style is what Orange is warning you of or um, advertising when he says that this is a didactic work. Um, it's meant to inform you. Um, oh, and you have to come to it, he says, willing to be informed. Meaning, he's not, if you're not, don't come to it willing to be informed. He's not going to try to drag you over. Um, that's, you know, one way we often think of what arguments are supposed to do. If I just tell you something, you don't have to accept it. But if I give you an argument, you start off not accepting it and not wanting to accept it, and yet the argument forces you to. So Coleridge is not doing that. He's just telling you stuff. Um, so it's didactic. It's, it's supposed to teach you something if you're ready to be taught. Um, but actually, uh, you know, there's this stuff. Um, it's actually, uh, there's, there apparently are three different audiences that he has in mind. So there's three different things that you might, uh, that you might appropriately come to this work wanting to be taught or informed about. Um, Um, and uh, these are all described on page Roman numeral six. So by the way, I should say something about this, about the reading. I mean, I have a printout of it here, but this is just a printout of what's online. Um, I realized when I was reading through it that it's a little confusing. I should have put some marks in it to show where the reading begins and ends. Um, uh, it says on the syllabus, and if you get to the middle of a sentence and then you see that the next page doesn't continue that sentence, that's a sign that uh, you went beyond the end of the reading, that chunk of reading. But so anyway, Roman numeral six. Um, where he's talking about for whom is this work intended? And he says, um, so first of all, it's not completely clear that these are three different groups. You might think it's the same group, but I think it's three different groups. For as many in all classes, so in all classes, I mean, this is interesting. He actually does make certain assumptions about that level of education of his audience. If you read this, you probably noticed he doesn't always translate things when he quotes them in Latin or Greek, because he assumes 
that especially with Latin, it seems that you you understand it somewhat at least. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure how serious he is about that all classes thing. But anyway, for as many in all classes as wish for aid in disciplining their minds to habits of reflection. So This sounds very similar to what he's talking about in The Friend um, when he talks about method. Um, so uh, that's, there's still something like that you can get from this work as well if you're just interested in how to discipline your mind or discipline your mind to habits of reflection, right? Um, it's something like acquiring methodical habits. Um, the second is that it's, um, there's a dash and then it says, so it doesn't say and or or, um, or that is, it, there's just a dash. That's why it's not clear whether we're talking about a new group or the same group, but anyway, for all who desirous of building up a manly character in the light of distinct consciousness are content to study the principles of moral architecture on the several grounds of prudence, morality, and religion. So, um, build up a manly character. Studying moral architecture. Um, what he means by manly here, he doesn't explain. It's not clear whether it's supposed to be man as opposed to woman or man as opposed to boy, for example. Um, that is, does this mean a mature character? Or does it mean a character that has some characteristics that we associate with, or that Coleridge associates with men as opposed to women? Um, but, uh, but it's something, it's some kind of virtuous character. I think we can say for sure is included in that. Um, and then the third one is, again, these are all on page Roman number six. And lastly, for all who fear an feel an interest in the position I have undertaken to defend, this namely, that the Christian faith, for instance, in which I include every article of belief and doctrine professed by the first reformers in common is the perfection of human intelligence. An interest sufficiently strong to ensure patient attention to the arguments brought in its support. But again, I have to say there, there aren't a lot of arguments. <laughs> um, so, uh, Right, so are people, people who, third audience is people who want to like, see a defense of, Christian faith as rational, as constituting perfection of the human intellect. Um, 
right? I put Christian faith in quotes here because he means something very specific by Christian faith, as he says in those parentheses. Every article of belief and doctrine professed by the first reformers in common. So by the first reformers, right, he means the early thinkers of the Protestant Reformation. And when saying that they profess them in common means that uh, he's excluding ones that are particular to, let's say, Luther, but Calvin doesn't agree or something like that. So it's some kind of core orthodox doctrine of Protestantism. So he's, on the one hand, obviously ruling out Catholicism, and on the other hand is ruling out later developments in Protestantism, such as Presbyterianism and so forth. Um, um, that's what he says. Uh, but on the other hand, I think, well, maybe this isn't so clear. I mean, um, by choosing Robert Layton as his authority, he's really um, I guess showing where 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 specifically his heart is, which is not just in this core thing that supposedly agreed on by all early reformers, but by something that's a little bit unusual in Protestantism and um, uh, is only orthodox in the context of, or traditional in the context of England, right? Namely Anglicanism, Anglicanism which, um, right? In this country, we call it usually Episcopalianism because it's, uh, um, it's an organization of the church which retains all the bishops and archbishops and all that stuff and just uh, like removes the pope from the top. <laughs> so um, um, it's actually, uh, at least in the so-called high church Anglicanism, the people who, who uh, attach a lot of value to those things that Anglicanism still has in common with Catholicism. It's uh, it's actually, yeah, like I said, it's not uh, exactly standard early reformers. Okay, I've probably said more about that than I should. It's not that relevant to the rest of this class, most likely. But in any case, so that's the third goal. He's going to defend what he sees as Orthodox Christian faith um, as rational. Um, and I guess, I mean, the defense of it as rational is why this third goal somehow like requires a work that would serve these purposes as well. Um, as he says on page Roman numeral 11, uh, right, he just finished talking above how everyone, even the pagan moralists, agree that the key to everything is reflection or self knowledge. And reflection is what the book is about. You know, reflection is the type of habits we're going to build up. How that's related to morality, I'm going to talk about a little bit later. But, um, but then in the next paragraph, he says, But you were likewise born in a Christian land, and revelation has provided for you new subjects. So, like, what he could say at this point is, and um, you don't have to stop with self-knowledge and this pagan uh, moral framework, um, right, of rational reflection or something like that. Do you have extra information that's come from revelation? And now we can do that instead of that kind of um, uh, 
uh, ethical philosophy, just uh, just concentrate on what you've learned directly from God. <laughs> but that's not what he says. Right? What he says is, um, revelation has provided for you new subjects for reflection and new treasures of knowledge, never to be unlocked by him who remains self-ignorant. Self-knowledge is the key to this casket, and by reflection alone can it be obtained. Right? So um, what he wants to show is not that um, Christian faith is something independent of pagan philosophy and just coming out of somewhere else. He wants to show that um, it both requires rational reflection of the same kind that, for example, Socrates, you know, uh, wants us to do. It both requires that. And therefore, because it requires it, it's in some sense the outcome of it. It's the perfection of it. So the kind of religion we're talking about here is broadly speaking a rationalist type of um, religion. Um, right, as opposed to mystical or um, well, see, I mean, it depends what you mean by that. But as opposed to mystical or fideist or or other forms that you don't really have a good name for, but like as opposed to, to any kind of picture of a relationship between reason and religion that would put them either at odds with each other or at least as just independent of each other, this is a view that reason is central to religion. Um, and this is why he says on page nine, this is why he feels he has to add, add on page nine, because the thing is, so for Christianity in particular, this is a problem, at least for the type that he's trying to defend. Right? I mean, if you're a Unitarian or something, um, uh, might not have trouble with this, but the type of Christianity he's trying to defend includes mysteries, incarnation, the Trinity, you know, uh, atonement, these things that, um, as they say, pass all human understanding. You're supposed to believe them even though they pass all human understanding. So Coleridge in Roman numeral 9, Coleridge, this is the beginning of how he deals with that. There are indeed mysteries in evidence of which no reasons can be brought. But it has been my endeavor to show that the true solution of this problem is that these mysteries are reason, reason in its highest form of self-affirmation. So, um, 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 he's going to try to reinterpret what reason is and or what a mystery is in such a way that it's not a contradiction for um, the belief in, in mystery to be the essence of being rational. That's basically what he's saying. Um, broadly speaking, that's similar to, to the approach that Hegel was taking around the same time, um, but uh, um, I don't sense that Coleridge is particularly close to or interested in Hegel, um, so that's just kind of a parallel thing, I think. Um, and the, you know, in detail, it's quite different what he's trying to do. Um, Okay, so those are the three, I guess you could say three ways you could read the book, and there are three ways you could read the whole book. Um, right, like he emphasizes when he talks about this one, about moral architecture, he says, you know, to study moral architecture, 
from the point of view of prudence, morality, and religion. Nevertheless, there does seem to be a kind of correlation between these three and the three parts of the book. Right, the first, the three parts of the book are about prudence. Um, right, there does seem to be a, a kind of correlation. Um, I mean, in the case of religion, I guess this is pretty clear why you would put these two together. Um, this is the, the person who's reading the book for this reason is going to be most interested in getting to the religion part. Um, in the case of morality, it also seems that. Right, that although they're reading all three parts, they're reading it with a view to becoming virtuous and studying moral architecture. Um, so, uh, you know, their, their interest in the book as a whole is centered on the contribution to morality. And as far as prudence goes, um, so prudence. Um, um, I mean, you can think of the difference between prudence and morality this way. I mean, this is kind of a Kantian way of thinking about the difference between them. That morality is when you, um, or I guess, let me put it the other way. Prudence is when you use reason to decide what to do in order to get some things that you already happen to want. Who knows why? That's being prudent. Whereas morality is when you somehow use reason to decide what you should want to do. Right? So morality is when reason gives, prescribes an end, a goal to you. Whereas prudence is just when reason is being used to reach the goal that you, you already have. Um, but, um, um, so I think, I mean, that is basically how Coleridge is understanding that distinction, but, um, but he thinks what makes prudence, um, what, what makes prudence belong on this list, what makes it a kind of, um, um, lower grade of religion and morality or something like that is that um, that use of reason to decide what to do in order to get to your goals actually is a kind of um, self-discipline. So this is the way he describes it. This is on page 51. Um, prudence is an active principle and implies a sacrifice of self, though only to the same self projected as it were to a distance. Right? So, like, you know, suppose I have a piece of cake in front of me and it really looks delicious and I really want to eat it. So, um, but I'm trying to lose weight. That's my goal, right? That's my end. So I consult reason, say, what should I do in order to reach my end? And reason says, don't eat the cake, right? So, I mean, reason didn't tell me that I should lose weight. I mean, like maybe ultimately it could, but that's not the situation we're talking about, right? That's just what I happen to want. Who knows why? Reason didn't tell me that, 
the reason did tell me if you want that, don't eat the cake. And so reason is telling me like, if yourself as a whole or yourself projected into the distance, right? Like yourself as, I mean, it's partly just a matter of like projected into the future, you'll regret it later. But I think you can understand more abstractly too. It's like yourself um, regarded as an overall principle that's supposed to be regulating a lot of particular actions. Um, that self projected as a distance is now um, requiring you to not do what you want in this particular situation. That's the self-sacrifice. Um, and so it's possible to um, um, to fail to be reasonable on those terms, right? It's possible to be trying to lose weight and to have reason tell you don't eat the cake, but you really want the cake and you eat it anyway. Um, so it's it is it is like morality, <laughs> right? It is a matter of you know. Um, taking your, indiv your individual self-interest and sacrificing it to a principle. It's just the difference for morality is that, that, that you're, you're not actually supplying the principle by doing this. You have to take that from somewhere else. Okay, so that was all by way, a long way of explaining why I think also prudence goes with this, right? Like, if your main goal of reading this book were to um, discipline the mind to certain habits, so that's basically a prudence type goal, right? That's saying, you know, I want to be able to behave consistently to have my considered self um, supply the leading thought or the initiative thought, as he said in the friend, um, that, um, that then my particular self at every instant will have to submit itself to. I want to learn how to do that. Um, Okay, so I'm going to come back to um, I'm going to come back to use this correlation to figure out certain things about what um, Coleridge means by understanding and conscience and reason. Um, so, but for the moment, I'm going to um, talk a, a, a little bit more about what it means, what the the general issues are facing a rationalist version of religion and how Coleridge is dealing with them. Um, so, um, or how he's dealing with them or not dealing with them. <laughs> so, one of the big problems for a rationalist version of religion is the universality of reason. Um, as opposed to what appears to be the particularity of revelation. Right, so the reason um, um, whatever we mean by it exactly is a faculty that all human beings have in common. I mean, that's the traditional Aristotelian, not necessarily Aristotle's definition, but traditional Esther Aristotelian definition of human being. A human being is a rational animal, um, right? So um, reason is something that all human beings supposedly have in common. Um, but revelation is um, in uh, religions that involve revelation <laughs> is typically not seen as something that all human beings have in common. It occurred at a particular time and place, and some people know about it and have accepted it, and other people either don't know about it at all or have rejected it. Right? So, um, um, 
So one approach to that problem is to claim that revelation, at least in some minimally necessary sense, right, that is enough, let's say, to make this difference that he's trying to make between religion and morality, um, that revelation in some minimally minimal sense actually is available to everyone everywhere. And um, he doesn't seem to be doing that here in Aids to Reflection, but I bring it up because he does seem to be doing that in that essay in the Friend. Um, right, so on page 515. Um, He talks about the, um, the eminence of being as such. Um, and uh, without getting into the details, at least the moment of what he means by that, it's something that anyone can recognize. Right, all you have to do is somehow managed to, as he said on page 514, actually, hast thou ever raised thy mind to the consideration of existence in and by itself as the mere act of existing? So whatever that means to, to like, is it, you know, hast thou ever said to thyself thoughtfully? It is. Heedless in that moment, whether a man before thee or a flower or a grain of sand, so um, whatever way of responding to something that's in front of me is talking about it, and however difficult it might be, it's something presumably that anyone at any time could do in principle, right? It's not something that a voice from the sky or whatever you think ordinarily would think about particular revelation has to intervene to make happen. Um, and what he does on page 515 and 516 is to identify that experience of being as such with prophecy. Um, This turns to the bottom of page 515. He for whom it manifests itself in its adequate idea, dare as little arrogate it to himself as his own, can as little appropriate it, either totally or by partition, as he can claim ownership of the breathing air or make an enclosure in the cope of heaven. I don't know what I cope. I think it's a cope like a cape, maybe. <laughs> I think I have to look that up. Anyway, he bears witness of it in his own mind even as he describes light and light. And with the silence of light, it describes itself and dwells in us only far, so far as we dwell in it. So, you know, he's, he's saying that this, um, um, experience or phenomenon, as Heidegger might say, of being as such is like, is not our own, but comes to us from outside and we bear witness to it. And we experience ourselves as dwelling in it as much as it dwells in us. Um, and on the next page at the top, he says, by what name then canst thou call a truth so manifested? Is it not a revelation? Right, so he's, like I said, he's identifying this kind of experience that he says that anyone could have of no longer caring whether it's a flower or a grain of sand or whatever in front of me, but just thoughtfully saying it is, he's identifying that with the reception of a message from God. Um, I mean, maybe that sounds far-fetched, but like you have to remember how philosophically speaking, how difficult it is to understand what it, so to speak, literally means for God to talk to someone. I mean, you know, 
God could create a voice that I hear in my ear saying things. But uh, God created all voices that I hear in my ear saying things. How is this one God's voice? Right? Like it's, it's actually not that easy <clears throat> at all to explain what it's supposed to mean literally. Um, you know, uh, so, um, so, so that's why I guess, I mean, really from the beginning of the philosophical tradition, I mean, this is a, a lot of what Socrates is doing in the apology. There's, uh, philosophers have, have looked at the descriptions of what, um, revelation or, you know, the word of the oracle or whatever is supposed to be and have said, well, you know what that is? That's, that's philosophy. <laughs> that's what revelation is. So this is, Coleridge is giving a version of that in the French. Now, I mean, um, and he goes so far as to say that therefore, you know, the early teachers of man were inspired and we should trust the traditions of mankind as to their working miracles as divine emissaries. And he has a kind of argument why that makes sense. Um, so, um, so, so that would kind of incorporate traditional religion into this view of what revelation is, except not the part where one of the religions is right and the others aren't. Um, so, um, the way he's talking there, and a lot of people who are or entertain the possibility of being rationalists, strict rationalists in a religious context. By the way, I should say, the way I'm using the term rationalist here is not as opposed to empiricists. I probably should have said that at the very beginning. It's confusing, right? I mean, usually when I say rationalist in a philosophy class, I mean as opposed to empiricist. But at this time, we're saying rationalist as opposed to irrationalist, right? Or super rationalist or something like that. Someone who says that religion is against or outside or beyond reason. Um, right. So, you know, so it's it's typical, like people like Al Farabi and Kant and, you know, Wolf and perhaps Aristotle means this in some it's at least how Al Farabi understands Aristotle. That you know um, that yes, the philosophical truth is the core of religion, but it's the core of every religion, or of every sufficiently good religion, or something like that. Um, and what the individual religions do with it is kind of dress it up in a contingent system of symbolism. Um, and. Uh, so, like I said, it's, that's what Coleridge seems like he's moving towards in that passage in the front. Um, whether he really thought that in 1818 um, or not, I'm not sure, but it seems like in 1825, he doesn't want to say that. Um, right? I mean, he he's, he's not here to defend religion against irreligious philosophers. When he talks about irreligious philosophers, I guess he's thinking especially about Hobbes and Hume, Spinoza maybe. I'm sure he includes that or not. But in any case, but he's not just defending religion against irreligious philosophers, he's defending Christian faith against irreligious philosophers. He wants to show that Christian faith is meaning this very apparently particular thing, the doctrines held in common by the early reformers, um, that's the perfection of the human intellect. So, um, I want to erase this. And I'm going to look back because I'm going to need it later. And if I jump, I'll have no room, so I'm going to have to just, uh, I guess, be a little bit of <laughs> um, So, um,
So this is what makes, or at least is one of the things that makes the issue of symbolism and the nature of symbols so important to color to this point. Um, right? Because so what I said, uh, again, call it like, You don't know who Al Farabi is? Uh, Google Al Farabi. Look him up in Wikipedia. You should know who Al Farabi is. I don't know if you know conscious. Anyway, um, so um, the picture they have of um, the relationship between philosophy, or let's for these purposes call it reason, and religion is that the religion symbolizes the, the rational or philosophical truth. Um, I mean, this is, uh, I guess I said that Aristotle could be understood this way. Also, I mean, this is how they understood the passage in the Republic, where um, um, where Socrates describes the philosopher kings as like looking up and beholding the forms, and then um, coming back down to the city and painting images of them. That's how he describes their activity of like the philosophical rule. So, right, so the relationship between reason and religion is reason is a religion is a kind of like sensible image of the philosophical truth. But they say, you know, it's part of the nature of a symbol that it's a, to a certain extent arbitrary. Um, to a certain extent arbitrary. Um, there's many different ways of symbolizing the same truth. And that's why there's many different religions. So if you don't want to say that, um, as for example, Maimonides and Goldrich don't want to say that, you, um, you have to end up thinking a lot about the relationship between symbols and what they symbolize. So, uh, I'm not going to talk about what my thinks about that partly because I don't understand it, but <laughs> but I do know that he spent a lot of time talking about the meaning of words, individual words, and about the meaning of words in general, just as Coleridge does here. So uh, so I think um, you know you can see that what Coleridge wants. is, well, I mean, so, I mean, he's actually going to identify this with, with religion, of course, right? We already saw it, but, um, but still, um, it's going to have a symbol, but the symbol is not going to be arbitrary. And um, and the the symbol. So, like I said, he's calling this part the religion, um, but this part is still um, what you might normally call the religion. That is the actual institution, the way people behave that shows that. Um, that they are members of this religion or whatever. That he's still going to agree as a kind of symbol, but he wants to say it's not an arbitrary symbol. So how does he make that out? Well, I mean, first of all, he, um, I think, what he says about words, and as I said, just like 
Maimonides, he spends a lot of time talking about, as he calls it, the science of words, <laughs> right? Both in general and in a lot of specific cases. Um, um, his view of words, I think, is a model or um, example or something of his view about symbols generally. And um, his, that is his view about words when they're used appropriately. Oops, this is not right. So what he says about words is that when they're used appropriately, they're quote unquote living. This is um, 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 right, so if you look on page Roman numeral eight, and he's responding to some guy called Horn Took, who wrote a book called Limited Words, and, uh, and uh, but anyway, um, uh, so Horn Took says that. Uh, I guess the subtitle of Warren Took's book was Language, Not Only the Vehicle of Thought, but the Wheels. <laughs> so whatever Horn Took meant by that, it sounds like a character out of the Hobbit, but it's actually uh, a real person. Um, but anyway, um, so Coleridge's response to that is, the wheels of the intellect, I admit them to be. But such as Ezekiel beheld in the vision of God as he sat among the captives by the river Kavar, Kavar or however you pronounce that in English, whithersoever the spirit was to go, the wheels went, and thither was their spirit to go. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels also. <laughs> right? So, uh, leaving aside Ezekiel interpretation <laughs> and so forth. Um, that's right. That's that's the same passage that um, what's his name? Chariots of the Gods. Said it was Ezekiel describing uh, his encounter with space aliens. Anyway, <laughs> the way Coleridge is understanding it or taking it as a metaphor or parable is that um, words are. Um, um, Necessary for thought in the way wheels are necessary for a wagon, let's say. But the relationship between the word and the thought is closer than the relationship between the wheel and what's in the wagon or the purpose of the wagon or something like that. The wheel is the spirit of the thought is in the wheel. And that's why the word is alive, or you could also say it's organized. Right? Taking that thought that he emphasized in the friend, that it's um, the, the word is um, the specific way it is for the purpose of that thought. Um, and it's not just something like um, so a wagon wheel can be used for the purpose of moving my wagon, but um, it isn't what it is because I'm using it for that purpose. It would be the same thing if I didn't use it to move my wagon. Whereas at least the way these people are thinking about living things, you know, the legs of a living thing are only legs because they're organs of a living thing and the soul of a living thing is in them. Meaning that, you know, they only count as legs at all because they're being used for this purpose of preserving and maintaining a certain part of the purpose of preserving and maintaining this organism. So, um, 
So whereas the relationship between um, what I'm doing with the wagon and the wheels is to a certain extent arbitrary, right? Like if, um, if you substituted sled runners for the wheels, um, maybe depending on what the terrain is like, it would be just as good. Um, maybe it would even be better. Um, but anyway, even if it was not as good, I would still be able to do the same thing with the wagon. Like, you know, I would still be able to drag it along, whatever. Um, so a wheel is, you know, at best the most convenient thing that I happen to find around for this purpose. But um, the legs of a living creature are not arbitrary. The soul of the living creature prescribes that it's going to, that at least when it's complete, if it um, hasn't been, isn't somehow maimed or defective or whatever, that this is what we'll use for benefit. Um, that's obviously a way of looking at things that can be problematic for various reasons, but, uh, but on the other hand, I think it's a pretty it's a natural, certainly traditional way of looking at what, what living things are like. Um, so, so, so Coleridge, in saying that the words are living and that the, the thought is the spirit that's in the word, is saying that the relationship in the word and its meaning is not heard. Somehow. Um, and so, you know, I mean, the way this, this actually manifests itself, it's not just something he says on that page, you know, um, it manifests itself in the way he deals with words and with language. Um, he is always trying to demand a kind of strictness or precision in the use of language. Um, but it's not the kind of precision that's attained by clearly defining your terms when you start out. Right, like that's what Locke suggests. If you want to use language strictly and precisely, what you have to do is tell me what idea you associate with this sound, and then I'll know. Um, of course, you know, we have to have some ideas in common for that to work at all. But anyway, but that's, you know, that's the, that's Locke's prescription for how to speak clearly and precisely. Coleridge is not telling you to do that. Rather, this is a conservative, right? Locke's is a, you might say, um, um, liberal or progressive demand for clarity. It says, you know, tell me what you're gonna do from now on, and if we agree on that, then we can um, go forward together. Coleridge is making a conservative demand for clarity, constantly doing that. Um, meaning that, this, that the key to speaking, speaking strictly and precisely is to use words in their original correct meaning. Right, so this is what he says on page uh, 36. Um, I mean, like first he talks about what mathematicians and biologists and chemists do, and it's more like what Locke is suggesting. But then he says, in the business of moral and religious reflection, in the acquisition of clear and distinct conceptions of our duties and of the relations in which we stand to God, our, to God, our neighbor, and ourselves, no such difficulties occur. At the utmost, we have only to rescue words already existing and familiar from the false or vague meanings imposed on them by carelessness, carelessness or by the clipping and debasing misusage of the market. Clipping, he's talking about, right, like, taking off some of the metal that I formed. Um, 
So your coin doesn't have as much metal as it's supposed to, and then using it, you know, as if we're a whole coin. Um, so um, um, that's what he's saying happens to words in the marketplace. We, we, yes, for convenience, we use them for stand for different ideas than they used to stand for. And it's a marketplace, right? Like we may agree on that, which from Locke's point of view would make it fun. But from Coleridge's point of view, it's debasing the currency. It's so um, the word should mean this, and we're using it to mean something else. Now, like how far he wants to go with that is not completely clear to me. Um, I mean, to some extent, this is the kind, this is the type of precision and strictness that poets, I guess, are always looking for. Right? Like, uh, when a poet is looking for the exact right word, I'm talking as if I know something about poetry. I really don't. But, my impression is <laughs> when a poet is looking for the exact right word, of course, they, that problem of not knowing the exact right word to go right here is not a problem that can be fixed by redefining your terms. You have to find the word that's already right. <laughs> you can't make another word be right for it. Um, um, however, I mean, it's possible to understand that um, and still pretty much agree that the meanings of words are arbitrary. Right? They're arbitrary, but they're established by convention that individuals can't change and so on and so forth. Um, by the way, I guess that's part of why Locke thinks that poetry is um, a kind of abusive language, or at least he implies that. Um, but um, but uh, if you took this seriously enough that you said, no, it's that word, <laughs> it's, it's not just that, that's, that this is what people usually use it for, and you can't just change that by redefining it. It's, that's what that word means. Then if you took that seriously, you might end up thinking that it wouldn't work in just any language, right? I mean, that's usually one of the main reasons we think the relationship between words and their meaning is arbitrary because there's lots of different languages. Um, so, uh, um, so like I said, if you took this seriously, you might have to say, well, yeah, there's lots of different languages, but only one of them is the one that uses words correctly. <laughs> and that's the one you have to speak if you want to do this. And if that sounds like no one would think that, basically that's Heidegger's position. I mean, it's a little more complicated because in a way I don't quite understand. There's two languages, Greek and German. <laughs> um, but between Greek and German, you know, that's where that's how you could do philosophy. So like if, you know, Coleridge says, well, I want to do that in English, Heidegger, Heidegger will say, See, sorry, you can't do that in English. <laughs> um, Coleridge, as far as I know, he wrote an enormous amount that I haven't read. So, um, I mean, that is, I, I should put it this way. He wrote an enormous amount of which I read only a tiny bit. <laughs> um, so maybe he does talk about this somewhere. But at least in this reading, he doesn't seem to consider this issue either way. Um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, he does use Greek, Latin, and English, occasionally German, I guess. Um, but he doesn't present a theory of, you know, why it's legitimate to use various different languages. Um, uh, he did hate French and claimed that French was just a but perhaps he was just exaggerating, but he called French a jargon, <laughs> right? like not a real language. Um, 
but um, so anyway, I'm, that's why I said it's not clear to me how far he wants to press this, but in some way he's saying the words are not arbitrary symbols of thoughts. Um, um, the same issue definitely is going to come up at Emerson, but it's been getting more difficult than Emerson. But in any case, getting back to Coleridge, so what he means in the case of words, as I said, is a little bit unclear. But if you take the same, like the parallel in the case of the relationship between religion and its symbol. Um, so um, basically what he says is this, that, um, Sure enough, religions in general are like this. It's going to be here a great reason with morality. Religions in general are like this. They're different symbolic representations of the moral law. That's what Kant would say about them too. I'll throw out with more complicated. But, um, but in any case, that's what Kant would say about them. All these different religions are different symbolic representations of the one moral law. Um, so, uh, so if you admit that, how can Christianity be different? How can Christianity be special? And he says it's because in the case of Christianity, that's how we do it. Morality is the symbol. Morality is the symbol. And reason, in some sense, that's higher than morality is the religion. And this is not arbitrary. There's only one moral law. So Christianity is like the pure religion, like stripped of these arbitrary symbols and having only the one symbol that all of these were trying to get to, basically, something like that. So I'll, I'll read you where he says this. This is on page uh, 22. I think that's what he's saying, but it's a little bit hard to understand. Um, it's not on page 22. Page 16. Yeah. And we start on page 15. Um, this is Introductory Afer Aphorism 23. The outward service, thrice kea, that's a Greek word that he talks in the footnote about what it means. The outward service, thrice kea, of ancient religion, the rites, ceremonies, and ceremonial vestments of the old law had morality for their substance. They were the letter of which morality was the spirit, the enigma of which morality was the meaning. So you notice, I mean, when he talks about the old law, you might think he's talking about Old Testament versus New Testament. And I think he is talking about Old Testament versus New Testament, that is like biblical Judaism versus Christianity. Um, but he says, um, but remember, he starts it by saying, starts by saying, um, the outward service of ancient religion. Ancient religion in general, I think, is what he means. So, in other words, I think what he's saying is that biblical Judaism and um, Greek paganism and so forth are really on the same level today. And then he goes on, but morality itself is the service and ceremonial, cultus exterior. Threskea, cultus exterior, obviously means external cult or worship, right? 
uh, cultus exterior, thrace care of the Christian religion. Right, so that's what I say, this is what he's saying. And for, and for because religion, Christian religion and morality have this relationship, um, it's both true that um, religion is something higher of which the outward manifestation is just the symbol. But on the other hand, it's also true that the symbol isn't arbitrary and that it has to be this symbol and that you need this symbol to get to this as well. Is his claim. So, um, hold on, I'm running a lot of time. Of course, I could just go on because there's no one here. <laughs> I do want to go home. Uh, so, um, try to go a little bit faster. Um, I think, weirdly, when there's no one here, I tend to digress more. I don't know. Anyway, um, okay, so all this is still pretty abstract, especially like I haven't really said what morality is or what this religion is that's supposed to be higher than morality. So, um, you know, I mean, the reading for next time is going to be more from the aphorisms on religion. So that's going to get more into the question of what's going on up here. But I still uh, I want to say something about setting up that issue now. And um, the first uh, step towards that, I guess, is what he says on page 27. Introductory aphorism 32. It may be an additional aid to reflection to distinguish the three kinds severally, meaning these three kinds, according to the faculty to which each corresponds, the faculty or part of our human nature, which is more particularly its organ. Thus, the prudential corresponds to sense and understanding. The moral to the heart and conscience. I'm not sure what he means by heart. I'm just going to write conscience. I'm not sure what he means by conscience either, but heart is particularly hard for me to get in here. And the spiritual, that is the religious, to the will and the reason. So, um, so first of all, like um, this difference between reason and understanding is one that Coleridge talks about quite a bit. In fact, he says, this is on page Roman numeral eight, he actually says that another one of the main reasons for the book is to enforce this distinction between understanding and reason. So um, this is based on something in Kant, right? Kant distinguishes between understanding and reason. Um, but it's a distinctively German idealist reading of Kant, um, I think, as opposed to, for example, Schopenhauer, who, who uh, attacks Hegel on exactly these grounds. Says, basically, he says that what Hegel calls understanding is what Kant calls reason, and what Hegel calls reason is nonsense. <laughs> so the Coleridge is on the side of, of Hegel, or more directly Schelling. Um, and 
the way this works out is that as in shelling, I'm not sure if I emphasized this as much as I should have when we talked about shelling, but as in shelling, understanding goes together with sense. Right? Understanding is that it's part of the activity of the finite self dealing with those apparently alien self sense impressions, right? It, 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 um, it has to exert its own activity back, and the way it does that is by forming empirical concepts, and that's the activity of the understanding. Oh. Um, so, um, um, so it's an active faculty. It does represent the, the self trying to somehow impose its own principles, but um, um, but it manifests within finitude, and that's why it's connected with prudence, right? That's uh, like I said, you know, um, prudence is a kind of self-discipline of the will, but which nevertheless has to take its content from somewhere else. That's it, right? The actual object that I want doesn't come from prudence. It comes from apparently outside, so to speak. Um, so that's why prudence is connected to the understanding, is an activity of the understanding, is maybe is the practical side of the understanding. I'm not sure exactly how Coleridge wants to line them up, but anyway, that's why they go together. Um, um, right, as opposed to reason which is somehow able to see the internet in the fight somehow or other um, and um, in the first instance at least in the practical philosophy you know in shelling and it has something to do with what Coleridge means by morality presumably it does that by supplying an end to the finite self. So, you know, um, um, uh, this is the principle by which I'm going to organize my whole being, and it comes from me, not from outside. Um, Um, you know, why he identifies this, this stage, this kind of like a practical appearance of reason with conscience. I wanted to say something about that, but I think I'm running out of time, so I won't. Well, oh, maybe I should say something. Started a little bit late and there's no one here, but I'll be keeping it late. So maybe I'll just keep going. Um, yeah, because I because I did want to say um, that you know um, to help understand what conscience means here, you can look first of all back at that essay from a friend, page 507. The very beginning of it. So it starts as there are two wants connatural. How do you pronounce that? Connatural to man. So are there two main directions of human activity. And the two main uh, directions of human activity are trade and literature. And he says, further down the page, the trade and literature correspond to two forms of method. Right? Remember, this is essay 11 within the part of the friend that's called Essays on the principle of Principles of Method. 
So um, saying, actually, there's two kinds of method. One is associated with trade, and the other is associated with literature. Um, so in the AIDS reflection, Um, he alludes to the same distinction at near the very beginning, page Roman number five. An author has three points to settle. To what sort his work belongs, for what description of readers it is intended, and the specific end or object which is, which is to answer. There is indeed a preliminary interrogative respecting the end which the writer himself has in view, whether the number of purchasers or the benefit of the readers. So that's the distinction between trade and literature. Right before we start asking, um, the questions, the detailed questions about the method of this book. What kind of book is it? For whom is it intended? And what is its main purpose? We have to ask what type of method is it? Is it trade method or literature method? If it's trade method, then all of those things are relative to what will bring the, the most purchasers. Um, now, I mean, you might not think of that as a bad thing necessarily. I don't think Locke would think of that as a bad thing. Actually, the essay concerning human understanding in the epistle to the reader at the beginning, he talks about how um, he says something like, um, if you get this, as much enjoyment out of reading this as I got out of writing it, then I trust that your money will have been well spent. <laughs> Right? That is, he's explicitly saying, you know, um, it's okay that my book is going to be measured by how much someone is going to pay for it. Um, as opposed to by whether it will really benefit them or not. This, again, is a kind of difference between liberalism and conservatism or other liberal ideologies, perhaps. But anyway, between liberalism and conservatism, the liberalism says, well, you know, um, you have to decide for yourself what you think benefits you. And here's some money that you can spend, or if we don't give it to you, right? You have to work for it. But anyway, here's, here's some money, or you have to inherit it. More likely. But anyway, sorry, here's some money that you can spend after you've decided what you think benefits you. So, I mean, that's really what it comes to when you say that the method is the method of trade. But um, whereas the other method of literature is the method of, like, um, I know what's really better for you. And in Coleridge's case, at least with this book, it's not like, and I'm going to force you to take it, but it's like, I'm only going to write what's really better for you. And uh, um, if you're not ready to accept it, what can I do? <laughs> right? So, like I said, you might, you know, you could imagine someone thinking that both of those are valid or the first one was better, but Coleridge definitely thinks, as you can tell, when it goes on in the rest of the paragraph. But this may be safely passed by, since where the book itself or the known principles of the writer do, writer do not supersede the question, there will seldom be sufficient strength of character for good or for evil to afford much chance of its being either distinctly put or fairly answered. So I mean, that's a pretty convoluted sentence. And but all I want out of it is that he thinks of this as a difference between good and evil. I guess you could imagine that it goes the other way if you didn't know anything about Coleridge. <laughs> that he thinks that if the view of number of purchases is good and the view of benefit of the reader is evil, but that's definitely not what Coleridge thinks. 
right? So, um, so why am I going into all this detail about this? Um, um, So conscience, presumably, is like the ability to discriminate between good and evil, and to choose good. So if one of these types of method is good and the other one is evil, conscience is going to be the faculty that allows us to choose one and not the other. Um, and um, the two are identified with the difference between reason and understanding. That is, Coleridge identifies them with that. I think that's clear. Um, he describes the situation where that um, where the literature activity predominates this way. He says, under the ascendancy of the mental and moral character, the commercial relations may thrive to the utmost desirable point. Right? So he's saying that when the literature activity predominates, trade can also be in as good shape as it's desirable that it should be, <laughs> right? Like the trade could get better, but if trade getting better would be worse for everyone, right? So that um, the, the predominance of the literature activity, you know, you know um, is the best thing you can do for the trade activity too, so to speak. While the reverse is ruinous to both. He says, but on the other hand, if the trade activity predominates, not only will it not, allow the literature activity to flourish to the extent that's desirable, but actually in the end it will undermine itself. Um, um, and the reason I think that, that that's talking about the relationship between understanding and reason is because he says the same thing in Aids to Reflection about um, the relationship between those two. This is page Roman numeral nine. Um, I'm not seeing the quote here, but anyway, what he says is whoever transfers to the understanding the primacy due to the reason loses the one and spoils the other. Right again, when you so when you put understanding, which I'm now identifying with trade, and you can kind of see why these would go together: trade, prudence, um, accepting ends from the outside. Um, you tell me what you want, um, how much you're willing, what you're willing to give me for it, and I'll try to get it. Right? I'm not going to worry about what's actually good for you. That's so when you try to put this over this, not only is it bad for this, but it undermines itself as well. And conscience is somehow about the proper ordering of those things. Um Um, well, I'll just say one more thing and then I'll, I'll end and I'll leave so I have a little bit more than I wanted to say, but I'll say it next time at the beginning. Um,
So another way to describe the difference between these two activities, Tori gives on page 508, again, in the friend, is that um, in the pursuits of commerce, the man is called into action from without. Right? Again, that's what I keep emphasizing about the understanding and prudence, that they're called into action from without. Um, that uh, in the pursuits of commerce, the man is called into action from without in order to appropriate the outward world as far as he can bring it within his reach for the purposes of his senses and sensual nature. Whereas on the other hand, the nurture and evolution of humanity is the final aim. Or sorry, where on the other hand, the nurture and evolution of humanity is the final aim, there will soon be seen a general tendency toward an era seeking after some ground common to the world and to man, therein to find one principle of permanence and identity, et cetera, et cetera. So um, 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 the bad method, the methods associated with trade and prudence or understanding out of their proper place, right, in ascendancy over reason. That bad method is the method of trying to appropriate the um, A sensible world to purposes that are ultimately its purposes. Right? I'm trying to appropriate the sensible world for the for, for the sake of my own sense, sensible and sensual nature. And that's why it's going to be self-defeating. I think is what Paul is saying. It's going to be self-defeating because um, uh, Ultimately, that's not going to that's not going to serve me, not even in my sensible or sensual nature. The purposes are someone else's purposes, they're the world's purposes, whatever. Um, so conscience, which is going to be the thing that tells us not to do that, but to put reason on top. Um, that's why conscience involves, um, is necessary to, or is it somehow closely connected to self-knowledge or reflection? This is, again, back in the thread of what Paul says on page 509. Over these shadows, the shadows of the sensible world, as if they were substantial powers and presiding spirits of the stream, Narcissus-like, he hangs delighted, till, finding nowhere a representative of that free agency, which yet is a fact of immediate consciousness, sanctioned and made fearfully significant by his prophetic conscience, he learns at last that what he seeks, he has left behind. Right? So with the prophetic conscience, it's prophetic because it's going to be leading us on to, to true religion if we follow it all the way. But the prophetic conscience um, keeps reminding the person who's in this way immersed in the sensible world and external purposes um, keeps reminding them that um, they won't find their own freedom there. They won't find their own principle of action, their own principle of giving themselves an end rather than accepting it from somewhere else. Where will they find that? It's not in front of them, it's behind them, right? Meaning, you have to turn around and look back at yourself. Um, and that, oh, I erased it, is reflection.
So um, morality is what stands between the understanding and reason because morality is the act of reflection that shows you that the finite self of understanding is not sufficient. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. Um, I may send out an email asking if people actually want me to come in here and lecture or whether they want me to lecture at all. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I mean, I know it's a small class, but um, maybe everyone's watching the recordings. But anyway. I'll try to figure out, but uh, unless you hear otherwise, I will be back here on Tuesday. And uh, hope to see you then. Okay, bye.